braking was real good and uh, I was impressed with the overall handling. In the 80s, the USA saw the emergence of several cars that failed to impress drivers and are now widely regarded as some of the worst vehicles ever made. These cars face criticism for various reasons, including poor build quality, unreliable performance, and lackluster design. Despite efforts by car manufacturers to offer affordable and innovative options, many of these vehicles fell below expectations and left a lasting negative impression on consumers. From luxury cars lacking luxury to compact cars with serious reliability issues, these cars represent a cautionary tale about the automotive industry's challenges in delivering quality products. So join us as we explore the 13 worst cars in the 1980s nobody wants back. This could be the car you've had in mind. Citation. Number one, Chevrolet Citation. The Chevrolet Citation, introduced in 1980, quickly earned a notorious reputation due to its reliability problems and subpar construction. Despite Chevrolet's high hopes, the Citation faced numerous issues and plagued its performance and durability. Many owners reported frequent breakdowns and mechanical failures, tarnishing the car's image in consumers' eyes. The build quality was a significant concern, with numerous complaints about components falling apart or malfunctioning prematurely. This led to widespread criticism of the vehicle's overall design and manufacturing process. The Citation's troubles were further exacerbated by its lackluster performance and unimpressive handling, failing to meet drivers' expectations, seeking a reliable and enjoyable driving experience. As a result, the Citation became synonymous with disappointment and frustration among car buyers during the 1980s. Its reputation as one of the worst cars of the decade was solidified by its poor reliability record and inability to deliver on the promises made by Chevrolet. Despite attempts to address some of its shortcomings, including recalls and improvements in later models, the damage to the Citation's reputation had already been done. Now the Chevrolet Citation is often remembered as a cautionary tale of the pitfalls of rush production and insufficient quality control in the automotive industry. As the Chevrolet Citation's troubled narrative concludes, what other pitfalls awaited drivers in the tumultuous world of the 1980s automobiles? Were there other contenders vying for the title of disappointment? Let's get in the Ford Escort, a vehicle with its own set of challenges and critiques. Well, which one do I choose? There's so many of them. I know, the Escort Sport. Number two, Ford Escort early models. The early models of the Ford Escort, introduced in the 80s, garnered a fair share of criticism due to their various shortcomings. Despite Ford's efforts to create an affordable and practical compact car, the early iterations of the Escort fell short of expectations. One of the main issues plaguing these models was their need for refinement, with many owners noting cheap interior materials and uncomfortable seating. Also, reliability was a significant concern with reports of frequent breakdowns and mechanical failures leading to frustration among drivers. The performance of the early Ford Escorts also left much to be desired, with sluggish acceleration and poor handling contributing to a less than pleasant driving experience. While later models would see improvements in these areas, the initial reputation of the Escort as a lackluster vehicle persisted. Despite Ford's attempts to address these issues over time, the early models of the Escort still needed to be improved among car enthusiasts. Despite later successes with the Escort line, the early models remind us of automakers' challenges in producing a quality product that meets consumer expectations. Cimarron Cadillac with four-cylinder engine for better gas mileage and all of the other standard features plus these options. Number three, Cadillac Cimarron. The Cadillac Cimarron, touted as a luxury compact car, faced significant criticism during its time on the market. Despite bearing the prestigious Cadillac emblem, the Cimarron was essentially a rebranded version of the Chevy Cavalier, lacking the refinement and performance expected of a luxury vehicle. Consumers were disappointed by the Cimarron's lackluster interior, which failed to deliver the luxury associated with the Cadillac brand. Rather than offering premium features and materials, the Cimarron's cabin resembled its more modestly priced counterpart, the Cavalier, leading to widespread buyer disappointment. Additionally, the Cimarron's performance could have impressed with its underpowered engine and lack of agility further detracting from its appeal. 
even with attempts by Cadillac to position the Cimarron as a luxury offering in the compact car segment, it failed to resonate with consumers who expected more from the renowned luxury brand. The Cimarron's poor sales and hostile reception ultimately led to its demise, and it's now remembered as one of the worst cars to come out of the 80s American automotive industry. Its failure is an exemplary tale about the dangers of diluting a brand's image by offering subpar products that do not meet consumer expectations. Amidst the disappointments of the Chevrolet Citation, Ford Escort, and Cadillac Cimarron, a glimmer of hope emerges in the form of the Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon. But were these compact cars truly the affordable saviors they promised to be, or did they harbor their shortcomings? Designed with Super Ride, lots of room. Motor Trend made Omni Car of the Year, and you, tens of thousands of happy Omni buyers, have made our little car a star. Number four, Dodge Omni Plymouth Horizon. The Dodge Omni and its twin, the Plymouth Horizon, were widely recognized as affordable and fuel-efficient compact cars during the 1980s. However, their reputation was tarnished by criticisms of their build quality and overall driving experience. Despite being popular choices for budget-conscious consumers, both the Omni and Horizon were plagued by issues related to their construction. Many owners reported problems with the car's reliability, such as frequent breakdowns and mechanical failures, which diminished their appeal among buyers. The build quality of these vehicles was often criticized for being subpar, with complaints about cheap materials and components that wore out prematurely. The driving experience offered by the Omni and Horizon was also deemed lacking refinement, with poor handling and noisy interiors contributing to a less than pleasant ride. Despite attempts by Dodge and Plymouth to address some of these issues, such as introducing updated models and making improvements in later years, the damage to the reputation of the Omni and Horizon had already been done. As a result, these compact cars are often remembered as some of the worst offerings from the 1980s American automotive industry, with their shortcomings overshadowing their initial popularity as economical transportation options. The 1982 Cavaliers, a whole new family of quality-built, four-passenger, four-cylinder, fuel-efficient front-wheel drive cars from Chevrolet. Number five, the Chevy Cavalier. Though marketed as an affordable option in the 1980s, the Chevy Cavalier earned a reputation for its numerous shortcomings. Despite its low price tag, the Cavalier struggled to impress consumers due to its poor build quality. Some owners reported issues with components falling apart or malfunctioning prematurely, contributing to a perception of unreliability. The engines used in the Cavalier were also criticized for their lack of durability and performance with frequent breakdowns being a common complaint among owners. Compared to its competitors, the Cavalier fell short in power and handling, diminishing its appeal in the eyes of consumers seeking a reliable and enjoyable driving experience. Despite efforts by Chevrolet to improve the Cavalier over the years, including updates and revisions, its reputation as one of the worst cars of the 1980s persisted. Indeed, the Cavalier's legacy serves as a reminder of the importance of quality control and innovation in the automotive industry and the consequences of prioritizing affordability over performance and reliability. Nowadays, the Chevy Cavalier is often regarded as a prime example of a car that failed to meet the expectations of consumers and critics alike, further solidifying its place among the least desirable vehicles of its era. While the Chevrolet Cavalier stumbled under its shortcomings, the Pontiac Fiero emerged as a beacon of innovation with its unique design and mid-engine layout. But did this distinctive car overcome the reliability challenges that plagued its early models, or did it succumb to the same fate as its counterparts? With a newly available high-output V6 and a hot new GT version, Pontiac announces even more Fiero. Fiero! We build excitement. Pontiac. Number 6. Pontiac Fiero Early Models The Pontiac Fiero, known for its unique design and mid-engine layout, faced significant challenges with its early models during the 1980s. Notwithstanding its innovative approach to design, the Fiero struggled to maintain a positive reputation due to its reliability issues, especially concerning its engine and suspension. Many owners experienced problems with engine failures and topics related to the suspension system, 
which detracted from the overall driving experience. These reliability concerns led to disappointment among consumers attracted to the Fiero's distinctive appearance and layout. While the Fiero garnered attention for its sporty styling and mid-engine configuration, its performance failed to meet expectations, further exacerbating its reputation as one of the worst cars of the decade. Despite attempts by Pontiac to address some of these issues in later models, such as introducing more reliable engines and improving the suspension, the damage had already been done to the Fiero's reputation. The early models of the Pontiac Fiero serve as a cautionary tale about the importance of thorough testing and quality control in the automotive industry. Despite its initial promise, the Fiero's legacy is marred by its reliability issues, solidifying its place among the least desirable cars from the 1980s in the United States. Put a Chrysler LeBaron in your life for 79. Number 7. The Chrysler LeBaron Early Models In the early 1980s, the Chrysler LeBaron aimed to embody luxury and style, but expectations. Despite its luxurious appearance, the early models of the LeBaron were plagued by several issues that hindered their popularity. One of the primary criticisms was its poor build quality, with many owners reporting problems ranging from squeaky interiors to malfunctioning components. These issues contributed to a perception of unreliability as frequent breakdowns and mechanical failures became common complaints among LeBaron owners. Moreover, the performance of the early LeBaron models failed to impress, with sluggish acceleration and subpar handling detracting from the driving experience. Despite attempts by Chrysler to address these shortcomings, including updates and revisions, the damage had already been done to the LeBaron's reputation. The early models of the Chrysler LeBaron serve as a cautionary tale about the challenges of balancing luxury with reliability and performance in the automotive industry. Regardless of its initial aspirations to compete in the luxury market, the LeBaron's legacy is tainted by its reputation as one of the worst cars of the 1980s in the United States. Today it remains a reminder of the importance of thorough testing and quality control to ensure that vehicles meet consumers' expectations. As we bid farewell to the Chrysler LeBaron, were there any unconventional contenders who managed to carve out their niche? Let's explore the AMC Eagle, a peculiar fusion of car comfort and light truck toughness. But did this pioneering crossover genuinely bridge the gap between two worlds? Or did its eccentric design and mediocre off-road capabilities leave it stranded in automotive limbo? When nature makes it rain or snow, fight back, make it Eagle. Number 8. AMC Eagle The AMC Eagle, launched in 1979, holds a strange place in automotive history. Certified as the original crossover, it tried to blend car comfort with light truck toughness. Think station wagon with beefed up suspension and chunky tires. Sounds good on paper, and well, the execution was, well, unique. The Eagle's bulky design stood out like a sore thumb more Frankenstein's monster of car parts than a stylish blend. This odd look pushed away buyers seeking a handsome ride. Then there was the off-road ability. While the Eagle could handle a dirt path, it wasn't a champion climber. Serious off-roaders found it lacking, while everyday drivers questioned the need for its ruggedness. Stuck between two worlds, the Eagle appealed to very few. AMC tried different versions, but the quirky looks and so-so off-road chops only partially won over enough hearts. As we reflect on the peculiar legacy of the AMC Eagle, what about those seeking a taste of futuristic flair and sporty excitement? Now let's enter the Ford EXP and its Mercury counterpart, the LN7, promising sleek two-seater coupes for the discerning driver. Yet, did these vehicles deliver on their aesthetic allure, or were they shells concealing underwhelming performance and lackluster quality? Ford EXP. Combining sporty styling, the mileage that today's buyers demand, and impressive driving characteristics. Number 9. The Ford EXP Mercury LN7 In the 1980s, Ford introduced the EXP and its Mercury counterpart, the LN7, as their vision of modern two-seater sport coupes. Their designs were striking, featuring wedge-shaped bodies that exuded a futuristic appeal. However, the reality of driving these vehicles must match their sporty exteriors. 
Picture the anticipation of accelerating in a sports car, only to find the experience underwhelming. The engine, the same one used in the Ford Escort, provided lackluster acceleration that seemed more appropriate for a leisurely drive than an exhilarating sprint. Additionally, the handling left room for improvement, failing to deliver the elegant and responsive feel typically associated with sports cars. While it wasn't a total disaster, the EXP LN7 felt unsure in corners, leaving driving enthusiasts wanting more. Then there was the quality. Cheap materials filled the interior, prone to rattles and squeaks that grew louder with each mile. Rust also became a familiar foe, eating away at the car's body faster than most would expect. By the time Ford ended production in 1988, the EXP LN7's reputation was firmly cemented all show and no go. After we say goodbyes to the lackluster Ford EXP and Mercury LN7, our exploration of 1980s automotive disappointments takes us deeper into failed aspirations. The Oldsmobile Firenza was a luxury pretender in a decade defined by excess and innovation. But did this sleek contender possess the refinement and performance expected of a luxury car? Or was it merely a hollow shell adorned with an Oldsmobile badge? Number 10, Oldsmobile Firenza. The Oldsmobile Firenza aimed to be a fancy import fighter in the 1980s. It boasted a sleek design and an Oldsmobile badge, a symbol of luxury at the time. But beneath the shiny exterior, trouble lurked. Owners soon discovered the Firenza wasn't built like an actual luxury car. Rattles and loose parts plagued the interior shattering the illusion of refinement. Worse yet, the performance didn't live up to the Oldsmobile name. The engine, borrowed from a Chevrolet, offered sluggish acceleration and forgettable thrills. While some drivers might have appreciated decent gas mileage, it wasn't enough to compensate for the lack of pep. To top it all off, the Firenza wasn't known for reliability. Electrical problems and breakdowns became common occurrences, leaving drivers stranded and frustrated. The Firenza's attempt at a budget luxury backfired. It disappointed those seeking a premium experience and offered little reason to choose it over more reliable and exciting options. Despite its lackluster performance and reliability issues, the Oldsmobile Firenza found an unexpected place in pop culture. In the 1980s hit movie Back to the Future, the character Biff Tannen, portrayed by actor Thomas F. Wilson, drives an Oldsmobile Firenza in several scenes. While the Firenza's portrayal in the film doesn't necessarily improve its reputation, it does add a nostalgic element to its legacy. And Maserati built this new convertible. They made it everything you expect and made it exclusively for Chrysler. Number 11, Chrysler TC by Maserati. The Chrysler TC, a collaboration between the American automaker and the Italian luxury brand Maserati of the 80s, was a curious case of ambition gone awry. It was designed to be a head-turning fusion of Italian style and American comfort, but it needed to be more explicit. The hefty price tag screamed luxury, but the driving experience was underwhelming. The engine, borrowed from Chrysler's workaday LeBaron Coupe, offered decent but uninspired performance, a far cry from the sporty spirit Maserati was known for. To make matters worse, the TC's build quality left much to be desired. Electrical gremlins and rattles became unwelcome companions, tarnishing the Maserati name. The TC was like a wolf in sheep's clothing, a fancy exterior wrapped around a not-so-fancy interior and a forgettable driving experience. This confusing identity crisis left both car enthusiasts and luxury seekers cold. The Chrysler TC's short-lived existence serves as a reminder that slapping a luxury badge on an ordinary car doesn't guarantee success. Also, the Chrysler TC by Maserati had an unexpected cameo in the 1990s hit TV show Seinfeld. In Season 5, Episode 22, titled The Opposite, Jerry Seinfeld's neighbor, Cosmo Kramer, famously purchases a Chrysler TC, thinking it's a luxurious vehicle, only to discover its flaws and absurdity. This humorous portrayal of the TC added to its reputation as a quirky and misunderstood car, further cementing its place in automotive pop culture history. It's Pontiac's beautiful Sunbird with a spunky 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine and an interior like this. Number 12, the Pontiac Sunbird. 
Though popular in the 1980s, the Pontiac Sunbird wasn't strictly a shining star. Sure, it sold well, but beneath the agreeable price tag lurked a bunch of compromises. The looks were, well, forgettable. In a decade known for bold designs, the Sunbird offered a yawn-inducing silhouette that blended into the background. Then there was the quality. Cheap plastics filled the interior, welcoming rattles and squeaks with every bump. Parts felt flimsy, and Russ loved the Sunbird more than most cars. Performance was a little to write home about either. The reliable engines offered sluggish acceleration and forgettable handling. Compared to perky arrivals from Japan, the Sunbird felt downright dull. The Sunbird's popularity stemmed more from its affordability than any absolute driving pleasure. It was a car that got you from A to B, but not in a way that thrilled or impressed. The Pontiac Sunbird had a surprising stint in motorsport. In the early 1980s, Pontiac entered modified versions of the Sunbird in the IMSA, International Motorsports Association, racing series. These Sunbirds, equipped with turbocharged engines and enhanced performance features, competed in the GTU Grand Touring Underclass. While they didn't achieve significant success, their participation added a touch of excitement to the Sunbird's otherwise mundane image. Racing enthusiasts may find it amusing that a car known for its mediocrity on the streets once tried its hand on the racetrack. After bidding farewell to the lackluster Pontiac Sunbird, our journey through the 1980s automotive mediocrity takes an unexpected turn with the Chevy Lumina APV, a minivan with aspirations of futuristic flair and family-friendly functionality. But did this peculiar vehicle balance innovation and practicality, or did its unconventional design and lackluster performance leave it stranded in a realm of missed opportunities? There's only one minivan with a remote control sliding door, built-in child seats, anti-lock brakes, and driver's side airbag. Chevy Lumina takes good care of your family. Number 13, the Chevrolet Lumina APV. The Chevrolet Lumina APV was a minivan with a split personality. It aimed to be futuristic with its space-age looks, think rounded box on wheels, and featured innovative features like built-in child seats. However, this design, which earned it the nickname Dustbuster, alienated many buyers. Unfortunately, the focus on style sacrificed practicality. The Lumina APV handled poorly, especially when loaded with passengers and cargo. Its initial engine, a weak 3.1 liter V6, struggled to move this minivan with any authority, making merging onto highways an adventure. While a later 3.8 liter option offered some improvement, more was needed to overcome the Lumina APV's shortcomings. Despite its innovative features, the Lumina APV's strange looks, poor handling, and underwhelming performance kept it from minivan glory. It was eventually replaced by a more conventionally styled design in 1996. Despite its mixed reception among consumers, the Chevrolet Lumina APV entered the cinema. In the 1996 film Independence Day, the character portrayed by Jeff Goldblum, David Levinson, drives a Chevrolet Lumina APV adorned with a quirky Save the Earth bumper sticker. The minivan becomes an unexpected hero as David uses it to outrun an alien spaceship's destructive beam during a thrilling escape scene. While the Lumina APV's appearance in the film may not have improved its reputation as a minivan, its role as a makeshift escape vehicle certainly added a touch of excitement to its otherwise lackluster image. <laughs>